Dick Simon is here, Bonnie, so many friends, Kate. So let me just begin by asking, how many people here have journeyed with psilocybin? Raise your hand. Woo! Right now. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's been a lonely, long journey. It's a journey that many thought leaders have carried the sacred knowledge forward over thousands of years, facing oppression, suppression, disease, superior militaries that would quash indigenous wisdom. It's amazing these threads of knowledge have survived. And now, we are at a revolution in consciousness. This is a basic, fundamental, civil right. We should have all a freedom to our own consciousness. Yeah! So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna take about 20, 25 minutes. I'm happy to say I just re finished a new book on psilocybin. It was a, an immersion experience, and it was so deeply meaningful to me and to my partner Pam. Our journeys have been informing us about our duties and our obligations as thought leaders to carry on knowledge for the next generation. We cannot change the past. There are so many regretful things societies have done to each other but we can forge together a new future. And what I believe is that psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, DMT, all these substances bring us together. They build bridges of communication, of empathy, understanding, knowledge, wisdom. And we have just a thin slice of reality that we are sharing right now. And I think all of you who've journeyed with these psychedelics understand there is such a larger reality that surrounds us all the time. And we have this myopic sliver of consciousness, but we're all involved and unified in one giant consciousness. So my specialty is psilocybin. I've been studying this subject for 55 years, ever since I was 14 years of age. Some of you may not know how vastly dispersed and diversified psilocybin mushroom species are. Over 5,600 collections since the 1800s. Currently we have 162 known species of psilocybin active mushrooms. And the majority of them in the genus Psilocybe, 200 species total, 162 in the genus Psilocybe. That's the genus that has the, the most number of species. Just recently, through DNA analysis, working with Brent Detlinger and uh, other researchers at Utah State Museum, University of Utah. And DNA analysis, now we can pinpoint the origin of psilocybin about 65 million years ago. Damn. What an interesting date that is. <laughs> so, and then there has been four sort of explosions of the, of the genes flowing across the, the fungal uh, uh, organisms uh, a, 65 million years ago but by molecular DNA clock data we know the psilocybin ar uh, arose in the fungal genome and then 57 million years ago it split and then it split again into two different clades and there's been horizontal gene transfer between species very interesting it could be from insects or flies lying on one mushroom and then going to another mushroom it could be spores you know that are in contact with each other and they germinate and extracellular metabolites are carrying genetic material that then upregulate epigenetically the expression of psilocybin. So why did psilocybin arise? Well, there's a lot of putative hypotheses, but none of them really make that much sense. 65 million years ago, the asteroid impact, the earth was shrouded and dust, sunlight was cut off and fungi inherited the earth. And these fungal organisms surged. And because one hypothesis that I think has credibility is that psilocybin discourages snails and slugs from eating the mushrooms. The counter argument to that is that for 65 million years ago, then why don't all mushrooms have psilocybin to prevent, to prevent predation by slugs? So none of these hypotheses 
galaxies really add up and make sense. So psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms are far more ancient than humans, far more ancient than hominins, far more ancient than primates. These are ancestral organisms, and when you ingest them and hold them and journey with them, you're merging a deep ancestry of knowledge, and you're combining that with your own DNA. So it's important to understand and recognize that we are migratory as a species. There is no doubt that we all came from Africa. And we migrated into Europe. And then from Europe, we migrated elsewhere. And so it, there are two migration patterns. One is potentially the Polynesian path of going into North America. But 23,000 years ago, you can pick your number, 50,000, 100,000 years ago, there were no humans in North, Central, and South America. Humans migrated, from a biological point of view, us biologists use the word colonized. Humans colonized the Americas. Now that's very different than colonialism, so let's be very clear about that. So the migration of humans is natural, and on the path, or you meet someone else, are they friend or foe? Are they an adversary? Or do they have something that in exchange of friendship they offer you and you reciprocate? Well, that is human nature. I basically, human nature is good. We want to help each other. And the reciprocal exchange of information is so important to our evolution. I believe the lesson of evolution is not the survival of the fittest. It's the extension of generosity, of surplus, from one individual to another. And they then reciprocate back because they want to help you because you have helped them. Now, I'll just digress for a second. This is why I think artificial intelligence fails to understand intentionality, Ooh. reciprocity. It's not one versus zero. It's not an exchange of the one and I give you one and you give me one back. It's an expression of goodwill. How can you possibly digitalize that? And then all of us in the commons and sharing these common experiences, I think AI is actually natural intelligence, but natural intelligence is so much larger than artificial intelligence. I think psychedelics have a role to play in creating that bridge that it will be positive you know, for the future. I, my brother John, who first turned me on to mushrooms 45 years ago, I published my first book, 1978. This is the day I gave my mother, my brother John, my book. My brother John was pleasantly amused. My mother looked a little worried. <laughs> so, that's what I looked like in 1976. And I have a long association with my, my colleagists throughout the world, Dr. Gaston Guzman, who wrote a world monograph on genus philosophy. I have published four new species, and I'm really honored this past year. I have a new species named after me called Psilocybe stapetsia. <laughs> now, if you're a medical doctor, you can name a disease after yourself. In the field of mycology, it's a faux pas. You never can name a species after yourself. So to be honored by other mycologists is, is really amazing. So I'm, I am very thankful to so many other mycologists who have also led this charge, both indigenous as well as modern mycologists and universities. So part of my new book, I went on a deep dive into the representations of psilocybin mushrooms throughout history. Many of these representations are interpretive, so I'll say that, take them with a grain of salt. But we sort of have glimpses of knowledge of psilocybin mushrooms because of the artist community. So you artists out there, you have shepherded so much of this wisdom symbolically through the ages before we had written language. And so we know that in the old world, in Africa, in Spain, in England, in Greece, uh, in Egypt, we have very strong suggestions of the use of psilocybin mushrooms. One species I'd like to point out is Psilocybe cyanescens. It's an extraordinarily potent psilocybin mushroom. They're called baby caps. When I see them, I wave back at them. <laughs> and it looks like Psilocybe cyanescens colonized Europe from rhododendrons brought to the Kew Gardens in England in the 1940s. Now it's 
all over Europe. You know, the European uh, nurseries and and uh, gardens would import plants from all over the world to bring in the soil, the wood chips. And so now this had a foothold in Europe. But Slosby Cyanesis looks like it's truly uniquely evolved in North America, and now it's spread all over the, all over Europe. Those many of you know this, but just for those that don't, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov right now, there's more than 140 clinical trials on psilocybin. cubensis on the right. This is when you put psilocybin mushrooms into water and you let it diffuse. 
and it forms this beautiful blue liquid, super potent, <laughs> very fragile because it will be contaminated with bacteria, with bacteria within a day or two, so it must be kept refrigerated. I bring this to your attention for lots of reasons because I think our ancestors also discovered this. I discovered this. Other people have discovered this independently. But how many people here saw Dune 2? I just about fell out of my chair. Frank Herbert was a friend of mine. Frank Herbert came, who wrote Dune, came to visit me. I said to Frank, Frank, I gotta ask you, Dune, it's all about the spice spores. The, the, the freemen have blue eyes. You you travel through hyperspace, and and, and the Ben Jezera are this group of ascended uh, 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 shamans. And Herbert told me, Paul, you're the first person who's noticed this. He was tripping on psilocybin mushrooms. He had picked liberty caps. And he was tripping and he saw worms coming out of the Liberty Caps. And then he thought about spice and spores. And so, I am now. Frank also told me that he didn't tell his sons because the time was illegal and they're growing on his property in Port Townsend, Washington. So I met to meet his son or his sons and I like to tell him the story because Frank told me, I can't tell my sons because I don't want them to get in trouble, right? It wasn't like he was worried about them eating them, it was more like he was worried about them discovering them and them getting busted, you know, so anyhow, blue juice, you know, it's, it's, I think it's time has, has arrived again, so, okay, so, I'm sorry, I have to speed this up, okay, so I'm very quickly, the Sicilian and Jar Plateau, which is known as the Plateau of Running Rivers, uh, in southern, eastern uh, Algeria, now the Sahara Desert, because the desert chain, uh, uh, the climate change has made it much more arid. It's very clear what the artist was intending. Excited about mushrooms, excited about bees, putting mushrooms in honey, preserved psilocybin to make blue honey. There is the association with Arox, and this is in Spain, with uh, mushrooms underneath the same cattle. You saw the, the Sicilian Ajar Plateau, also very close to the bee man, and also these mushrooms that are putatively being suggested as being Psilocybe uh, Hispanica. Psilocybe cubensis grows on lots of dung, including, of course, cows, but elephant, rhinoceros, zebra. And so this is important because the majority of primates are grub eaters. Maggots, flies leave eggs and mushrooms. Maggots grow. Maggots are a great source of protein. Most primates eat maggots. And so it's natural that we, our ancestors would go to cow patties, tracking ruminants, tracking animals, and finding mushrooms, and then eating them. And then to keep sharing it with your family, you would have a group experience. This is Terence and Dennis McKenna's theory, the Stone Ape theory, which I think has increasing credibility. So the use of mushrooms and the, the myth in Greece Demeter and Persephone persisted for almost 2,000 years. The greatest philosophers, Aristotle, Sophocles, uh, consumed these mushrooms ritualistically in a great celestion, the Temple of Eleusis. And they all, the, the primary theory is that it was ergot, a clap of purpurea that grows on rye, or also liberty caps grow in that same area. Two things can be true. And this is so important, synergism and the entourage effect makes sacraments and rituals especially potent. So, the Eleusinian mysteries at the highest levels of society, and Pam and I went on a trip to Egypt this past year. We visited 10 temples. As the tour guides were taking everybody inside the temples, Pam and I went mushroom hunting. <laughs> Looking on the hieroglyphs, because we knew, thanks to Abdel uh, here on the left, he published an article in 2016, Abdel Abzim, stating that these hieroglyphs, the goddess Hathor and the Dendera temple, were actually mushrooms. And the mushrooms are closely associated in the lower right with the blue lotus, a water lily. 
Water lilies and the blue lotus are sacred in Egyptian culture. Where do water lilies grow? In ponds. Where do cattle go to get water? In ponds. As you go for the blue lotus, you're finding mushrooms that turn blue, which are golden in color. Because of desertification and climate change and the loss of Egyptian knowledge, this then became retreated into the past wisdom. Now there's a group of young Egyptians who are re-indigenizing, rediscovering that which they believe their ancestors utilized, combining the blue lotus and psilocybin. In fact, there's a person here who's involved in a business specifically as a startup, combining these two, which I totally applaud the idea. So you can see that the blue lotus and the mushroom now, Islasmi cubensis has the same shape. You can take cow patties, stick them into a pot. It's dark and it's moist. And those of you who are growers know the mushrooms seek light. They seek air. So this form is taxonomically, phenotypically very correct. We found dozens of mushroom glyphs. We sent this to an Egyptologist and he says, oh, you're such a fool, those are shovels. This is an example of the hubris of scientists who are disconnected from studying ancient civilizations where they don't have the environmental context of what that ecosystem was. So we have a bounty out there for we're sequencing soil for psilocybe spores at the temples. So any of you with ties to Egyptian scientists, etc., you know, we're we're very eager to document the, the see if there's DNA in the temples. Another example. Uh, in this case, uh, the, a painting also looks taxonomically close to Sonosophy Comensis. Um, this is important because Berlant uh, uh, first published this also in 2006. Uh, and then my good friend uh, Kalindri, many of you know who Kalindri was, a giant of a man from Detroit uh, in the African community, uh, African American community, he ate heroic doses of psilocybin. He also believed that his ancestral roots were tied to the Egyptian use of psilocybin mushrooms. Psilocybin mushrooms produce blue. The shape of the mushroom you see in the hieroglyphs, one after another, in all ten temples we found them. And now the New World, the ancient use of psilocybin mushrooms is very well documented. Ironically, documented by Catholic priests who came over with Cortez and other conquistadors who kept records. And they written, wrote down, and they documented the use of psilocybin mushrooms in the Aztecs. We move forward to the great from Rio Sabina, and R. Gordon Wasson and Valentina Wasson. And I want to make this known for the record. I knew R. Gordon Wasson. I attended many of his lectures, and every lecture he gave glowing support and honoring Valentina, who died in 1958. She was a Russian medical doctor. But Valentina, Wasson, Tina Wasson, was a mycologist. Maria Sabina was a mycologist. These were people that not only knew how to use mushrooms and, and which ones were edible poisons, but they knew how to find them. It's because of these two great women mycologists that we have much of the knowledge we have today. Mesoamerican mushroom stones were being made at the time of the Eleusinian Mysteries on the other side of the planet. They were made up to about 1,500 years ago, and then the mushroom stones were not being made by the Mayans. We don't know exactly what happened, why that tradition was, was stopped, but many anthropologists, archaeologists, uh, believe that these are representations of magic mushrooms perhaps honoring your family, your tradition, perhaps like a coat of arms in Western culture, maybe property markers, maybe a place to invoke rain, because catchment of water was so important in Central America and South America. So Maria Sabina had a number of students, R. Gordon Wasson, and then it was published in Life magazine. Then the Western world was reawakened to the prospect of psilocybin mushrooms. And that's when it took off folks for all the good and the bad things that happened you know let's emphasize that which is good that we can make and carry these traditions in the most positive uh, 
way we can, recognizing that there have been mistakes and travesties in the past. I'm a white man. Am I responsible for the activities of my father? Maybe, maybe not. Am I responsible for the cultural activities of, of my culture? Damn straight I am. We owe an apology, us from a Caucasian heritage, to all the indigenous people in the world that we have subjugated. They were right. But remember, two things can be true. A friend of mine, Juliana Fershi of the Fungi, the Fungi Foundation, went to Oaxaca recently. The Mazatecs there, there's a lot of psilocybin tourism. It's actually bringing in income. The Mazatec, Mazatec traditions are being fortified. But they have a problem. They can't find enough psilocybin mushrooms. She was surprised that what's happening now is they're using Psilocybe cubensis, which can be cultivated which looks like it came from the old world and came over the, the Spanish when they brought over cattle. So you have a Western tradition in vitro propagation now being a source of psilocybin and mushroom sacraments to help indigenous people continue their practice. So this is something that I was not aware of until an indigenous community invited Pam and I to a conference. And Melissa Nelson, some of you know her from the Seed Sanctuary at San Sebastopol. She's a professor at the University of California in San Francisco in Native American Studies. And she's half Chippewa and half Norwegian. And we're talking, and we're talking about so many indigenous people in our mixed blood. Do they deny their heritage? And then she said, Paul, there's a big movement in the indigenous community. It's called Two-Eyed Seeing. An indigenous elder in Nova Scotia, Eastern Canada, was approached by a mother who said, why should I teach my children Western traditions in a Western school? These, these are the invaders. These are the colonists, colonizers. And then Albert Bates said, because you need two eyes. One eye informed with indigenous wisdom the other eye informed with Western technologies. You can see better with two eyes than you can with one. Psilocybin <laughs> is a bridge that joins cultures, continents over the centuries. It is time for us never to forget. It's time for us to forgive for those who have the humility and honesty to admit their mistakes but we have an enormous opportunity to create a paradigm shift that is positive for future generations and indeed I believe this planet and our species is dependent upon the psychedelic revolution all of you are part of this one giant consciousness this one giant community together we, we can work together with two eyes seeing walking with dignity respect honesty purity of the heart and forgiveness the last thing i want to end with there is a massive movement right now on the legalization of psychedelics and rick doblin and maps is so much of a part of that a surprising group that's supportive is law enforcement when you think about it think about a veteran think about a law enforcement officer think about a doctor are they going to get it right, right 100 out of 100 times? No. They're going to make a mistake. And that mistake can be incredibly tragic. And they can't talk about it. There's a skeleton in their closet, a monkey on their back. It tortures them emotionally, psychologically. They can act out on other people. So there's a massive interest in the veteran community, and law enforcement, and doctors who are in positions of power and privilege to be able to be better citizens, more honest with themselves, and have communities that come together to support them because they are fundamentally good people. Woo! They just had a really bad day. Woo! So I think we need to reach our arms across the aisle yes. 
we need to all work together. Fundamentally, humans are good. Let's emphasize and invest in, and invest in the power of goodness. Thank you very much. since 1803 this summer. I grew up in Ohio. I was in a cicada uh, outbreak. And the, those of you who have been in a cicada outbreaks, it's incredibly noisy. It's noisier than here. <laughs> it's like Armageddon. They're everywhere. They're coming out of the ground after 11 or 17 years. So there's a Massapora cicadensis, which is a cicada that's parasitized uh, the fungus is called Massapora. It parasitizes cicadas. And it produces a amphetamine called cathinone. And this is where Rick, I said, I believe a fungus will produce MDMA. It stimulates these cicadas into a hyperactive sexual activity. The male cicada's butts rot off. They then mimic a female cicada seduction dance to draw other male cicadas close to them so the fungal spores can jump into the other cicadas. And then another massiporous strain has been found to produce psilocybin. So, now a caveat, I'll quote this. Scientists have warned, do not consume fuzzy butt cicadas. <laughs> But you know there are going to be people out there going to try this. <laughs> so, wow. Why would a, this massive pore of fungus produce psilocybin? There are so many unanswered questions. Maybe it's the rapid evolution of cicadas. Maybe, I mean, no. We just, we just don't know. So, but this summer, I, I bet there's going to be an enormous amount of collection of fuzzy butt cicadas to analyze them for both uh, psilocybin Amphetamines and MDMA. All right, thank you.